Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, the show that is part of the Simply Luxurious Life online destination. Visit the blog, thesimplyluxuriouslife.com to find the show notes for each podcast episode, as well as much more weekly content to elevate your everyday and deepen your contentment. From recipes, motivational posts, videos of the cooking show series, style and decor inspiration, French and British inspired content, and the reader's favorite regular weekly post, This and That, which goes live on the blog every Friday. Now to today's episode. Welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 301st episode of The Simple Sophisticate. I am so looking forward to today's episode for the topic that I'm going to be exploring with you because it was as though this particular book that inspired it, I was finally ready. I was finally ready to learn or to be open to its lessons. And I say that because the book was published in 2018 had I come across it then, I, I think I would have wanted to read it. I think I would have wanted to learn from it, but I don't know if I would have been as primed to fully absorb it or want to continue to understand it and read it more deeply in multiple readings. We're going to talk about the courage to live fully and deeply. Seven ideas to put into practice for a life of true contentment. Now, before we dive into today's topic, this week's Petit Plaisir is a favorite show of mine that I have been enjoying this winter, and I think you will too if you haven't already come across it. So stay tuned as I'll share all about that and the creator and behind the writing process and the character creation um, at the end of today's episode. As well, I'm going to share with you a little bit about where the podcast is going. I know that going to two new episodes each month was a shift for listeners, but I have some exciting news. I'm not going to be able to share concretely what those that news is, but I want to kind of give you a taste of what I'm thinking about with regards to this podcast, because I sincerely love creating and producing these episodes, and there's a reason why I've had to kind of slow down, but I don't want to slow down permanently. So stay tuned. I will share all of that at the end of today's episode, but let's get into today's topic. So being courageous is something we often hear we think about heroes with regards to physical strength and and gumption to take a big leap visually for people to see you make a huge change. And sometimes we think about war, but we also think about sports and we think about, you know, standing up to the big guy and those kind of things. But this is the thing. Courage is something that not, not everyone's going to see on the outside, but you're going to feel it. It's going to be that choice you make within yourself. And so when I picked up the book, The Courage to Be Disliked, which was published in 2018, and it has become an international bestseller, I just came across it, though, in the late uh, December of this last year, 2020, and early January 2021. As soon as I started reading about what it was about, I wanted to read it. I wanted to bring it into my house. I wanted to add it to my library. And then I just... I just devoured it and I reread it. And as soon as I started reading, I knew I wanted to turn this into a podcast episode because I want you to read this book. I want you to apply it to your life because it's going to speak to you in its own way based on who you are and what you're trying to do and and what your journey is, which is very unique to you. So let's start with a quote. People can change and be happy from this moment onward. The problem is not one of ability, but of courage a quote from the book, The Courage to be Disliked by Ichiro Kishimi and Fumitaki Koja. As long as one keeps searching, the answers come. This is a quote that I have had in my classroom, in my journals for decades. And it comes from American folk singer Joan Baez. 
And she certainly narrows down succinctly and accurately the practice of finding our way. However, along the way toward the revelation of the answers that we seek, we must be courageous enough to feel uncomfortable for portions of the journey, as well as capable of homing in on the gems of wisdom and letting go of needing to be agile when trying something new in our lives. The answers we seek only come to those who accept the moments of clumsiness, the frequent stumbles, the nights and days of ambiguity and confusion, because embracing anything new, trying anything new, which speaks to what we are seeking and trying to understand, will require a beginner's mind. Learning to walk as a child, as a toddler, required of each of us, even though we don't remember this journey from crawling to walking. But I think sometimes it would be really helpful if we did remember this because it would teach us a lot and give us more confidence. But we went through numerous stumbles, falls forward and backwards, sometimes temporarily causing ourselves pain to our face, our knees and our bottoms. But we don't remember all of those stumbles because we needed to learn how to walk to participate fully in the life we had no clue awaited us. That analogy is important to keep in mind as as we choose to continue to search for our individual answers. And I too have to remind myself of this toddler parallel because it is really helpful. And as I grow older and hopefully not only in age, but in wisdom, I become more and more grateful for each challenge. One of the most valuable developmental skills the book argues is that a parent can teach their child how to overcome challenges from an early age. And That can only happen by letting the young child, the preteen, the teenager, the young adult navigate through tasks which appear difficult to them, but easy to the adult. So for example, starting really young, tying their shoes. Yeah, it's quicker and easier as the book points out for the parent to do it for them, but the child doesn't learn that they can learn, that they can become comfortable with discomfort. And then that's the motivation to try to learn. They learn that small bit of self-esteem grows. And that's just a small step of how challenges help us along our journey. Another axiom comes to mind, life doesn't get easier. We just become better equipped to handle well the challenges when presented to us. However, the caveat with regards to this quote is that we must keep stepping through the challenges and not settling and unconsciously ignoring the challenges Life will always present dilemmas, quandaries, and moments of difficulty that cause us frustration. It is our choice, though, to try to understand how to navigate through such situations and not be stopped by them. We, as we've talked about here on the podcast and on the blog as well, are the director of our lives, and it is up to us to direct ourselves to the wisdom necessary, learn that said wisdom, and then apply the lessons. Today, I am, as I mentioned, very excited to share with you a handful of insights that this book, The Courage to Be Disliked, taught me, but there are so many more. And the ones I'm pulling out aren't necessarily my favorites. Um, They're not necessarily the most important ones. They're the seven that I feel are the easiest to explain, and they are ones that I think would be very beneficial to every single one of us. There are others that really take time for you to get in there and get in the nitty gritty of it and to make sense of it and reread it multiple times. And I think sometimes, you know, a podcast or, or, or me explain it to you just doesn't do it justice. So I'm going to share with you seven lessons that I learned from this book that will require courage, but they will definitely improve the quality of your life and thus deepen your true contentment. Now, on the surface, each of these seven will appear easy to comprehend. So you're going to read the statement or hear the statement. I'm like, yeah, I get that. I hear that. I know that. But the first time we put the practice into use, it may be difficult. It may not be natural or seem natural to us because we've been doing something else for so long. But with time and consistent effort, the practice will become habituated. And before we realize it, our lives and our everyday lives, the long view and the short view, will change for the better. So let's take a look at this list. Number one, 
let go of competing with the world. Seeking to be superior in comparison with other people is a denial of our own journey and our true selves. As I will share in number five later on this list, we each have a unique something to contribute positively, but when we consume ourselves with proving ourselves in competition of any sort, we step away from self-growth and discovery of our unique talents and gifts. The only healthy form of competition, quote, comes from one's comparison with one's ideal self, end quote. Refrain from gaining status or honor, in other words, approval from the outside world, and instead invest in being yourself. Invest in self-growth and discovery and let go of competition, anything preoccupied with winning and losing, as, quote, it will inevitably get in the way, end quote. I start with that one because I think the competition, what I want to call it, the competition habit default sometimes is seen as natural and it's not. Um, We are human beings. We are not animals and we are more evolved and we are civil human beings. And when we understand that competition, which is why we promote sportsmanship, right? You you play the game to the best of your ability. You leave it on the floor, the court, wherever you are competing and you walk off the field and you're not at an enemy with the person on the other side. You just become better as that particular competitor. So it's not to say, don't go play sports. Don't go to competitions. It's you need to do this so that you are bringing your best self forward and you're not attached to the outcome that's key. And it's how you work with others, your teammates, even the people on the other side. Are you playing fair? Are you, there's so many different components. I mean, I've shared this before, but I have been an athlete in high school and college and I've competed at the highest levels in national championships and state championships. And there is a positive way to go about this. And, and, and after the competition is over, after you've won or lost, there can be some amazing benefits, but there can also be some horrible benefits if you didn't go about it in a way that was beneficial to everyone, meaning you only looked out for yourself. And this idea of not just doing something for ourselves is going to come into play with another point that I'm going to talk about, because by living our own life sincerely and authentically, we actually are contributing to a larger and better world. And that's what we take to the field or any competition if we do it in a way that's productive and positive. So number one is let go of competing with the world. And so whether it's sports or simply comparing yourself and your life to someone else's, let that go, let it go. And we'll talk more about that as we get through this. Number two, the meaning we give the events in our life journey determines its quality. Here's a quote from the book. We determine our own lives according to the meaning we give to those past experiences, Your life is not something that someone gives you, but something you choose yourself. And you are the one who decides how you live. Just to expand upon this, the life truth that I have seen again and again, and more vividly as I grasp its true meaning, is if we argue enough for our limitations, I can't do this, I am this, I'm not that, We get to keep those limitations and they become our reality and then they become ingrained and then it really does become really difficult to change them. But we've created that cement that we're standing in. We've poured the cement. (laughs) Society may have introduced it to us, but we've accepted it. And that's where the thinking for ourselves is so imperative for our life journey, being a critical thinker. Not because the limitations are truth, but because we made them true by accepting them. And then there's more of us that have become that way. It's not to deny different facts. It's what are you going to do with those facts? So for example, I consider myself based on all the readings that I've done to be an introvert, but I'm not going to let that stunt what I am willing to try to do. I am going to use that unique quality about me, my temperament, And do something positive and contribute to the world by embracing that gift. 
whatever that is. So there are facts. My temperament is something I can't change, but I'm not going to be limited by it. I'm going to thrive because I have that gift, so to speak. Are you going to let yourself be limited by them? Are you going to let it be what makes you unique? And then give that unique gift, whatever it is that you possess, to the world. I think this one is so powerful if we really truly, and we can't, and it's so much easier, (laughs) as we probably all know, to observe this in other people and not in ourselves. But we need to flip that and we need to look at ourselves and say, what is it that I'm saying I can't do? This can't happen. This will never work out. What is it that we're saying to ourselves that is limiting? And then re-examine that. Bring another thought to the process. Bring a better perspective to the process that will help you blossom and benefit others along the way because you're living your life and it is an example. Others are watching. That's number two. The meaning we give the events in our life journey determines its quality. Number three, know your tasks and let others tend to theirs. Now, this is a big piece of this book. And they describe it as the separation of tasks, meaning knowing what is our individual responsibility and what are the responsibilities of others. When we can determine that, this is my responsibility, this is yours. It's not about telling the other person, this is your responsibility. It's about owning yours and letting go, letting go of what others are responsible for. Now, when we do this Not only will we alleviate and remove much stress and worry in our own lives, it will also improve our interpersonal relationships. In the book, they use the example of a romantic partnership, but this applies to all things, your your children, your parents, your colleagues, your neighbors, the the world, other people that you're watching and getting stressed out about what they're doing because you're watching in the news. Here we go. Here's the example, though, with regards to a romantic partnership quote, you believe in your partner. That is your task. Number one, you've chosen to be with them. And so therefore your, your actions towards them, that is your task. But how that person acts with regard to your expectations and trust is other people's tasks. Intervening in others' tasks And taking on others' tasks turns one's life into something heavy and full of hardship. So another example, approval. If we feel we need to get the approval of someone else, we are taking responsibility for someone else's task. Our responsibility is to live our life in a way that, as we'll talk about in a later point, taps into what we can uniquely give to the world that is a positive contribution. That is our task. That is our responsibility. What is not our responsibility and what we cling to often that gets in our way is, but I'm not going to do it unless I get the approval of this person or that person or my community or whatever. That is not your responsibility. If indeed you want to step forward and be brave and be courageous, here's that word again, courageous, but there's something inside of you that has just, it's been constantly whispering and it will not stop. And now it's getting louder and you need to listen and you know, you can't explain why, but you know, you need to follow through and you don't know what everyone else is going to think. It doesn't matter what everyone else thinks. This is the title coming into play. The courage to be disliked. That's their responsibility, not yours. When you let go of seeking their approval, you set yourself free. And when we tell ourselves, no, I need the approval of people, we are standing in our way. They're not. We are standing in our way. So you've taken on their responsibility and you have not taken on yours. So you've done everything in reverse. And that is why the book argues you're not happy. (laughs) You're not content. And I think this book, based on my reading of this book, and I know some of you have already read it, When they talk about happiness, I actually see, based on their description, as speaking to contentment. Because contentment are things that we have control over. Happiness is something we can't control. It's just moments that we can appreciate, but we can't control it. Contentment is within, and it can be with us every single day of our lives. And that is the key, separation of tasks. In other words, know the boundaries of what is your task and what is the task of others. When we know that, we eliminate unnecessary worry and suffering 
And it will also make life, as the book describes, far more simple and enjoyable to live. Ha! I'm going to let you think about that one. And I have a sponsor I want to introduce you to. I'll be back with the next four items on this list. A focus on comfort without sacrificing style. Jenny Kane is our sponsor this week, and I sincerely am drawn to the quality that they are dedicated to. Jenny Kane's secret to an effortless and elevated home and wardrobe is that they pay attention to the timeless classics and they invite the neutral in so that therefore these items can live with us and be with us for many seasons and years to come. From the knit you're obsessed with to the slippers you won't take off, these are the items we want to have with us during these chilly months of the year. Now, I have had the opportunity to purchase my own Jenny Kane cashmere overcoat, and it is cozy, it is comfortable, and it is stylish especially during these chillier months. I love it. It's going to be with me for years. Well made and it feels so good. (laughs) So much comfort. Now they are known for their signature pieces such as their mules that are in leather and suede and shirley and many other textiles. And that is the classic shoe that started it all for Jenny Kane. Now they are an LA based brand, but if you're a listener of the Simple Sophisticate podcast, I know you will appreciate their mission, comfort and timeless style, quality and effortlessness. So what makes an item from Jenny Kane, a Jenny Kane piece? Jenny Kane believes that getting dressed should be the easiest part of your routine. With polished basics and home pieces that will never go out of style, they make everyday moments a breeze. With curated staples for looking and feeling your best, no matter your mood or your destination. You might already have a favorite cashmere sweater or well-worn pair of boots, but if it doesn't make you say, I'll never take it off, (laughs) it's not Jenny Kane. As a simple, sophisticated listener, you have the opportunity to take 15, 15% off your first order when you use the code simple at checkout. That's Jenny with an I, -I J-E-N-N-I-K-A-Y-N-E.com and promo code simple. So, Enjoy 15% off. Go to JennyKane.com and use the promo code SIMPLE. Welcome back. Number four on our list of ways to live more courageously in order to live with more contentment. Let go of the outcome. Just that simple. Let go of the outcome. And again, it's simple, but it's hard to put into practice if we haven't been doing that. So let's look at this a little more closely. This entire book centers around the Alderian psychology method, which is considered the third psychology method behind Jung and Freud. And it's the idea of taking responsibility for our own contentment, but that we do have the capability of creating a life of contentment. And so the Alderian way is not to cure the symptoms regarding when one exhibits a lack of self-confidence, meaning what happened in the past and dwelling on it um, as to how those events brought you to where you are. That's not the focus of the Alderian psychology method. Instead, it's to accept who you are right now and find the courage to step forward and let go of the outcome, which is what causes the fear And if we hang on to that fear, it's what causes us to not move forward, to not accept who we are in this moment. We are fearful because we don't know how it will all work out. Fear comes from not knowing, but we'll never know. No one knows tomorrow. And the key is you are here now and your fear is telling you what you actually want And you're fearful it won't work out. It won't happen that way. The only way to know if it will is to step forward. Now, I've written about this multiple times in the blog, and I'll link to a couple of those posts, because fear is different than doubt. Fear is out of not knowing. But you only fear it because you desire it in some way, in some form. 
But by not going forward, you're fulfilling the limitation prophecy of it never happening. Back to number two on our list. So number four is let go of the outcome. Number five, find what you can positively contribute to the greater world and the need to be accepted or liked will subside. Quote from the book, if you change your lifestyle, the way of giving meaning to the world and yourself, then both your way of interacting with the world and your behavior will have to change as well. Do not forget this point. One will have to change. You, just as you are, have to choose your lifestyle. It might seem hard, but it is really quite simple, end quote. Another quote to keep in mind with regards to this concept of figuring out what you can give to the world, I think this will help put into perspective what we're actually doing when we worry about what other people think of us. Here we go. Quote, a way of living in which one is constantly troubled by how one is seen by others is a self-centered lifestyle in which one's sole concern is with the I, capital I, end quote. This paradoxical truth reveals the freedom we can each attain when we let go of worrying about others liking us and instead focus on how to contribute to the world. True contentment is found not by applause and approval from the outside world, but when we begin to look within and discover what we can uniquely give to the world that is a positive contribution, that that is where true contentment resides. A positive contribution can be as simple as simply being a civil citizen of the world. For example, ob- obliging the city ordinance to shovel your sidewalk when it snows. Or stopping for f- pedestrians when you're in your car to let them cross the road. That is contributing positively in your everyday life. That is huge. That's fulfilling the social contract, contributing to a civil society. On a more grand scale, it could be to dedicate your expertise and all your learning and knowledge to developing a vaccine to curb the rise of a deadly virus. All along that spectrum, from as simple as stopping your car to let someone cross the street to on the other end, developing a vaccine to help the global community, are examples of positive contribution. But you only figure out how to do that when you stop trying to get approval from the outside world. That law to shovel your sidewalk isn't put in place to control you. It's to remind us all that we are living in this world together. And you benefit from that as well. It's like putting on your mask. You're benefiting, but you're also helping other people. And when you do those things, it seems simple but it's a small example of what you need to do with regards to your unique journey. What is it that you can uniquely do to help, to contribute positively to this world? You do have something. You may have many things. Take the time to figure those out. All along that spectrum, each of us holds gifts in which we can contribute positively to the community outside of us, which leads us away from being solely concerned with the eye. It may, and this book dives deep into this, and that's why I would encourage you to read it. It may initially, and this is why it's a paradox, seem that, how, wait a second, I'm going within myself to figure out what I can contribute. How is that not self-centered? Because you're not doing it for you. You are the means by which this gift is going to come forth to the world. (laughs) You are the vehicle, but you have to turn your vehicle on. (laughs) You have to take care of yourself and and, and nurture yourself so that you can get to that place and figure out what it is so that you can share it. Okay, I'll let you read the book for more if you're really curious about that. So that's number five. Find what you can positively contribute to the greater world and that need to be accepted and liked will subside. Number six, reflect on your comments, so your verbal comments and or your judgments of others to discover your own truth. Quote, an adult who has chosen an unfree way to live, i.e. living for the approval of the outside world, um, on seeing a young person or any person for that matter that is living freely here and now in this moment, criticizes the young as being hedonistic. Of course, this is a life lie that comes out so that the adult can accept his own unfree life. 
an adult who has chosen real freedom himself will not make such comments and will instead cheer on the will to be free, end quote. Oh, how I love this quote. So just a quick refresher. If we are judging others, we are taking on someone else's task, as we talked about in number three. So to begin with, let go of the judging. However, for the sake of this lesson, which the book includes to further the need and the understanding about separation of tasks, I find it helpful to remind us when others' words or opinions sting or wound us, what they are sharing has nothing to do with us and everything to do with their life journey and how they are feeling about how it's going. So give me, let me give you an example from my own life. Um, recently, a neighbor made a snide comment and a negative comment about my enthusiasm over the growth of my lettuce. As many of you know, I'm growing my own lettuce um, in my potting area, in my garage, and then soon I'll be putting it out on my porch. I'm so excited. I sowed it from seed. I was just so excited. And so when they made this comment, which I invited them in to share, I was like, look at this, look at what's happening. It hurt my feelings initially and instinctively as a human. But then I realized their inability to be able to celebrate with someone else in their joy reflects their own pain in their life at that moment in which life isn't going so well and it feels out of their control to solve it. And so I had to remind myself that those kind of comments come from a place of pain from the speaker and are not a reflection of me. Now, will I continue to invite that person to look at my lettuce in the future or, you know, something else I'm growing? Probably not. Probably not. You know, so that's a boundary I'm going to put up. But when we tend to our tasks and let go of what others' tasks are, we set ourselves free in more ways than we can initially imagine possible. As we continue to put the practice of separation of tasks into our daily lives, we eliminate so many instances of pain and hurt we will never have to know. And that is part of living truly free. So that's number six. Reflect on your comments and or judgments of others to discover your own truth. And now notice how I I said, this is a reflection we need to make of ourselves. Are we doing this? So I don't want you to reflect on what others have said to you so much because you can't control them. That, that, that's out of their hand. That's out of our hands. What they do is what they do. We need to not be that person. We need to not be making comments that are, you know, um, projecting our expectations onto them and passing judgment. So again, I use the example of my neighbor just to put into perspective how easy it is for us to take on someone else's pain and it's because that's not our task and their task is to, to heal themselves. And there's only so much we can do as for example, a neighbor, I can be a good neighbor. I can't be a therapist. So number seven is don't be afraid of being disliked. Ah, back to the title. Here's a quote. I am not telling you to go so far as to live in such a way that you will be disliked. And I am not saying engage in wrongdoing. Please do not misunderstand. One just separates tasks. There may be a person who does not think well of you, but that is not your task. One moves forward without fearing the possibility of being disliked. Before being concerned with what others think of me, I want to follow through with my own being. That is to say, I want to live in freedom. End quote. While it takes more than a couple of chapters for the separation of tasks to be fully explained in terms the young man will understand, because in this book, it's a conversation of the, the sage speaking these philosophical um, points to this young man who is skeptical. And so it's a continual back and forth. And I, I do see some similarities to The Alchemist in this book. If, you, if you've read The Alchemist's It's not exactly like The Alchemist, but it is a conversation of learning for a young individual from a wiser source. And in this case, the source is an actual person who's speaking back and forth. They call it the philosopher and the youth, philosopher and the youth. And it's kind of like a transcript, but it's well done and it's easy to follow. I think you'll find it quite easy to get through. The chapters are short. And so... 
it takes him a while to get through this whole idea of the separation of tasks for him to really absorb it. And ultimately, being able to separate properly leads to the ability to let go of what others think of us, leading us to be free to be our true selves. Again, being free does not mean causing others pain or directly doing something to be disliked. That is not your goal to be disliked. It's just that if people dislike what you're doing, you have to let it go. Such choices, if you did make them solely to be disliked, would not be tapping into what you can uniquely give to the world to contribute positively. The hard work, the courageous work is to fully explore your own inner being, become resistant to those who try to pull you back to following what the masses and crowds are doing, and instead continue to unearth the gifts you have always had within you. The world needs you to find those gifts, even though you and the world may not know exactly what you will find. But so long as it contributes positively to society, you must keep searching. Now, some readers, if you're thinking critically, may be saying, wait a second, positive is pretty abstract. It's very subjective. And you're right. You're absolutely right. However, I take the perspective that we desire to live in a world that honors humanity celebrates kindness, and wishes to uphold a civil society. When we acknowledge what is possible through understanding of the mind, through the social sciences of sociology and psychology, as well as neurology, we discover amazing truths about the motivations of human beings. All of this is to say, it takes time and intentional living to learn and apply, explore and observe, and then to be courageous in its application in our individual lives, because our only task is to journey within and let others do the same for themselves. We must let go of the outside world and take responsibility for what our unique contribution can be in not only our larger life journey, but in our everyday lives as well. So number seven is don't be afraid of being disliked. It will set you free. So as we conclude today's focus, reading and then understanding the contents of this book, The Courage to Be Disliked, requires close reading and rereading, as I've mentioned. Philosophy, literally composed of the words love, P-H-I-L, and wisdom, soph, S-O-P-H, means to love wisdom. Philosophy means to love wisdom. And a deep understanding of wisdom requires more than concrete surface simplicities. Any philosophical reading requires that we go deeper, not only in the reading itself, but into our own minds. Growth is hard and it can be uncomfortable temporarily as we stretch ourselves. But the more we grow, the more we regularly stretch ourselves, our reach, in other words, our understanding deepens as well. And our ability to apply what we have learned to our lives, it becomes more likely to stick and to change our lives moving forward, thus deepening our true contentment. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. I'll provide a link to the book on the show notes, the simplyluxuriouslife.com slash podcast 301. And I'll be right back with this week's Petit Plaisir. This week's Petit Plaisir is a PBS masterpiece series. It's new here in the U.S. It's already aired in the U.K. called Miss Scarlet and the Duke. And it stars Kate Phillips, who many will remember from Peaky Blinders. She also had a small part in The Crown, one of the early seasons when she played um, Winston Churchill's secretary. And she also had a small part in Downton Abbey. She played Princess Mary. And she is the starring role. She is Miss Scarlet. And she is flanked by the Duke, played by Detective Inspector William Wellington, played by Stuart Martin um, from Jamestown or Crossing Lines, if you have watched either of those series. What I enjoy so much, there's a lot I enjoy. So there are going to be six episodes. They have been airing every Sunday on PBS Masterpiece. 
at a nine o'clock if you have a PBS channel or if you have masterpiece PBS masterpiece streaming on Amazon Prime you can watch it at about six o'clock every Sunday night at least here on the west coast it's set in 1880s London and it's written and created by Rachel New now Rachel New is also the writer of four of the six episodes and she has been a writer on Grandchester she has been a writer on EastEnders and Monday Monday which is a comedy, uh, but she's primarily been writing British police dramas. And as she points out um, in a recent interview, she was inspired by a couple of different well-known characters from books from the past. And she explained that Liza Scarlet is a combination of Jane Austen's Elizabeth Bennet and Margaret Mitchell's Scarlett O'Hara. And then there are other elements that come into play, but those are the two main characters that come to mind. So if you know those characters, you kind of have a sense of who Miss Scarlet is. But I'll let the video of the trailer of each of these characters, Miss Scarlet and the Duke, share more. Here are the actors talking about the characters they play in Miss Scarlet and the Duke. The dynamic between them is... Unbelievable. I think Eliza finds it immensely frustrating that this man that she's known all her life... Will you at least listen to what I have to say? No. ...doesn't really respect her as a woman with any rights? No. But I haven't even told you no. what I... Interestingly, that goes both ways. You know, I have to gain her respect when she says to me, you're lazy, you, you make easy decisions and you go for what's right in front of you. You increasingly rest on your laurels. That is why you resent my opinions, because they stir you from a self-imposed slumber. He has to get her respect back, because she is uh, an amazing detective. So, you know, it goes both ways. I thought you'd be more shocked. If you saw the things that I see on a daily basis, nothing would shock you. No. It's a complicated relationship. It's kind of sometimes they fight like siblings. Must you disagree with everything that I say? Sometimes they are best of friends. They're essentially the only family each other have really got. So they're kind of stuck with each other. So, you know, you get those relationships when you're stuck with each other, you lock horns often. How did you open the door? Persistence. You should try it sometime. The situation they're in is always different. So uh, the stakes will be super high in one scene and they'll be sort of furious with each other. And then uh, chilled and, and, and friendly the next. I love how quickly they shift, really. I think that's the beauty of it. In a scene, you can uh, they can shift three times the sort of seesaw of who, uh, who who's sort of, yeah, and I think that's exciting. Did you follow me here? Do you want my help or not? Why would I want your help? So you have that irritated look on your face, the one that you usually reserve for me. Whilst they find each other very frustrating, he's always there to lend, uh, uh, lend a hand of support, which is what's so beautiful about their relationship. Please do try to stay out of trouble, Eliza. For my sake? Of course, William. Of course. So as you can see, I love, it's, it's a constant back and forth between these two, and the lead is Miss Scarlet, but you see more and more of her interaction with the Duke as each episode unfolds. And as I mentioned, there's going to be six episodes. Um, I believe the fourth episode, or maybe it's the fifth episode, is airing tonight, Sunday night. I'm taping this Sunday before Monday the 15th. And the good news is there is a season two. It's already been written and there will be a season two of Miss Scarlet and the Duke. Um, Rachel New has already written that. So again, I think, uh, I think if you are an Anglophile, if you appreciate a forward thinking script, I think you'll enjoy this series on PBS Masterpiece here in the States and available on Amazon Prime for everybody. All right. I hope you've enjoyed this week's Petit Plaisir where each week ideas are shared to make the everyday all the more enjoyable. Tune in at the end of each episode where I'll recommend a book, a film, a show, a recipe, anything that's a simple pleasure to satiate your sophisticated taste. Before I wrap up, I wanted to share two um, reviews and give thank yous to both of these listeners for sharing their thoughts on the show and give you some insight as to what's going to be happening in the coming months and year here on the show. This review comes from Danielle Morgan, 
and she writes, A timeless treasure. I've been listening for years and kept meaning to leave a review earlier because this podcast deserves high praise. I've listened to many podcasts, but this is one that has always remained in my library over the years. I look forward to playing this podcast usually while I'm gardening, doing the dishes, or cooking, and can always count on Shannon to brighten my day and freshen my perspective. She has a simple, elegant style that has rendered this content timeless. Danielle, I cannot thank you enough for your very complimentary review, and I hope to continue to live up to what you have found to be enjoyable about this show. The second review is what I want to comment on regarding where this show is going. They titled it, New Stuff to Listen to, Please. This is a lovely podcast. I discovered it while working from home, and I'd like to hear new material. It's a new year. New material, please. (laughs) Now, I don't know where you are in the journey of the 301 episodes. If you're at 300 and 301, you know that we're doing two new episodes each month. And I'll just speak to that. I just announced with my top tier subscribers that a third book is going to be released in early 2022. And I shared more details about what the book's going to be about. And so they know more. But what I wanted to let you all know is that is what a lot of my time is focused on at the moment. And I'm so excited about it. As I mentioned, my editor and my illustrator. So Inslee is my illustrator. And my editor, who I've worked with my previous two books, are all on board. And I just have to get to the business of adding a polish so that we can then all three work on the finished product. That is one reason why my podcast schedule is lighter than um, it has ever been before. The other reason, as many of you know, in April, my f- students are focused on the AP Lang exam, and it's, it's the busiest time of year for me as a teacher. And I want to honor both of my opportunities as a blogger and podcaster, as well as a teacher. With that said, I am really excited about some life decisions I'll be making soon. And my goal with this podcast is to continue to share what I learn and share it in a way that's applicable for individuals to apply to their unique life journey. As I find some things that help me, I want to share. That's what I've always been doing, just as we did with this book today. And my goal is to be able to share with you two new episodes every single month throughout the entire year. So that means that would be about 24 new episodes, 26 if we add British Week and French Week every single year. And right now we're running at about 20, 20, between 20 and 21. But that's with four months of only two episodes. And I don't want to have those big breaks anymore. But I'm doing that now because that's what enables me to bring the projects forward to you that I'm so excited to bring as well as balance with my teaching. So as I have bigger news to share, which will be coming in the next couple months, I will share that with you. But the big news right now is that I'm working on a book. It's already written. Now it has to be polished, then edited, (laughs) then put together so that it's something that I am proud of sharing with you come early 2022. So thank you for your patience. Thank you for tuning in. And um, I have books I've read already that I cannot wait to put into podcast episodes. The next new episode of this podcast will be Monday, March 1st. I'll be back then here on the podcast, but I'm always on the blog, thesimplyluxuriouslife.com. Be sure to stop by for even more inspiration and ideas on how to live your own simply luxurious life. And if you're a Francophile, I just posted a post which is all about French cozy mysteries. So if you want to stop by the blog and check out my six recommended French cozy mysteries, be sure to do that. I'll provide a link on the show notes, thesimplyluxuriouslife.com slash podcast 301. Until then, bonjour. Thank you so much for choosing to tune in. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. 
For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, visit the blog, thesimplyluxuriouslife.com, or pick up my latest book, Living the Simply Luxurious Life, Making Your Every Days Extraordinary and Discovering Your Best Self, now available on Audible and wherever audiobooks are sold, as well as in paperback and ebook versions. You can also pick up my first book, Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life, A Modern Woman's Guide, which is also available in paperback, ebook, and as an audiobook as well. To stay caught up on the most recent episodes of the podcast, blog post, the cooking show, and receive exclusive news as well as an extra dose of inspiration to jumpstart your weekend, subscribe to the Simply Luxurious Life's free weekly newsletter, which arrives in your inbox each Friday to enjoy with a hot cup of tea or cup of morning coffee. Until next Monday, I'm your host, Shannon Abels. Bonjour.